Why don't you start by introducing yourself? I'm Jeremy Adams, and I'm a high school student at Jones, and doing this fusion project with Dane. And I'm Dane, I'm also a Jeremy at Jones. We had gone to grade school together, so we knew each other reasonably well. Where is Jones? Jones is located in downtown Chicago. A no, pretty urban environment, pretty dynamic. Okay. You said you were both doing a fusion project. What exactly are you building? Right now, we're currently working on our second project, and this would be the polywell, which is going to be used to confine a plasma using electromagnetic fields, and hopefully we'll be able to study a lot of things related to those fields. Yeah, basically, it's a research project. We're just researching the plasma, essentially like a star, and seeing how it can take different data and get results from that. You're interested in fusion, and you're doing this fusion project. When would you say you first heard about fusion? How old were you when you first heard about nuclear fusion? I'd say we really first heard about it during our freshman year, especially during the spring. We had collaborated outside of school and during one of the mandated periods called NAC Lab, where we decided to pursue building a Farnsworth Hirsch Fuser, which is the predecessor to the polywell that we're building right now. Okay, so that was freshman year, and you guys were taking this required hour together, and you decided to build a fuser. Whose idea was it first? I was actually homesick from school one day, browsing a bunch of articles on the internet about different crazy science topics, and I came across the fuser, and then realized that a lot of other people can build fusers in their free time as kind of a hobby and also just to explore science. So then I brought that up to Dane, because I knew Dane was interested in science as well. And we ended up building it inside Jeremy's garage. And then come sophomore year, right after New Year's, we finally got to work. Our first reactor was just a demo reactor, teaching us the fundamentals, fusion, circuitry, and just the building aspects that we weren't aware of before. Because we didn't want to make a big investment in the polywell until later on. And it was exciting. It was really exciting. What was the first thing that you did to build your fuser? First, we got a bunch of parts from McMaster Car, so like steel plates and borosilicate glass, which was used in building our, our vacuum chamber. So it wasn't really a real vacuum chamber. It was just kind of something we pieced together with like some screws, aluminum plates we cut, and some glass, and gaskets too. The chamber was our first step in the fuser, and then after that, we went into the circuit, and we also bought a vacuum pump. The circuit was the hardest hardest part for us at first because we had no background in electrical engineering. How long would you say it took you to, to do all those things? Really kick us off like spring or freshman year, so probably a few months, but the duration of the project was maybe eight months total. Okay, and you said the circuit was the hardest part? Why was that the hardest part? The circuit was the hardest part for us because we needed to get electrical waveform into direct current. Now, most of what comes out of power outlets in the U.S. was an alternating current. Now, when it came out of the wall outlet, we put in a neon sign transformer, which allowed us to step up the voltage to about six and a half thousand volts. However, it still had the oscillation you know, sinusoidal waveform. In order to get the consistency we needed, we needed to build a rectifier bridge. It was just really challenging because Dane and I had no experience with electrical engineering before. So we had to do a bunch of reading on how to get a high voltage power supply. What were your resources that you turned to to learn how to do that? Google's always a great starting place. So are there references to Wikipedia pages? Because so that's a gold line of resources. Beyond that, we started contacting a bunch of you know, locals around here. We contacted an electrician. I knew the physicist who took a look at the circuit designs. So you solved the rectifier issue. And so when did you get your first plasma? January uh, 2nd. Of 2014. Happy New Year. <laughs> It must have been a really big accomplishment. It must have felt really cool to do that. Yeah, I actually kind of freaked out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> like, up until that point, we were troubleshooting the chamber and the whole circuit set up for about three weeks because we couldn't figure out what was going on. And I remember we improperly grounded one of the wires, you know, finally trying the new somewhat novel approach to what we had initially set up and succeeding was really gratifying. So we were over at Jeremy's garage working on this all over Christmas break? Yeah, it was in my garage. I first turned on and we turned off the lights in the garage so I could see it glowing better. It's was, it was pretty awesome. That's cool. What was in the chamber itself? Was it actually deuterium or was it something else? Our 
our vacuum chamber actually had a lot of leaks. So essentially, we just used high voltage to ionize like nitrogen in the air under a partial vacuum. It was a nitrogen plasma. We didn't use deuterium. But you had bought deuterium? Is that correct? Yeah, we bought yeah. it. We still actually have the canister. We're probably going to try to use it in the poly well. And how did you go about buying deuterium? Because I think a lot of people will wonder about that. We ended up buying it from this place called Cambridge Isotopes. And they sold us I mean, a pretty sizable bottle for, what was it, like 90 bucks, 100 bucks, something along those lines. You could contact them on the web and... They have the whole website and they give you deuterium of different purities and you can just punch in however much you need. We also had to clarify what we were using it for. It's possible to get it for a reasonable price and also to buy it for the purpose of a fuser, a fusion reactor. Did you ever go on Fuser.net? Did you set up profiles there and interact with the folks there? Yeah, yeah, we have. You feel like you're part of that group? Yeah. Whenever we have like some really difficult questions or we're just stuck with a technical aspect of our project, we'll post a question there. And there's always great feedback instantly, too. So Yeah, there's a lot of people on Fuser.net that are probably going to listen to this podcast. We got to give them a shout out. One in particular that you've used or it's just been the general melee of a lot of people who've commented on our posts and they're really helpful are way more knowledgeable on certain aspects like vacuum construction and circuitry on there so it's it's a great resource definitely also electrical engineering stack exchange and physics stack exchange are really reliable sources that have a lot of great results to questions all right so you've gotten glow and now you want to move on to the poly walls how did you build your poly wall first did you 3d print it yeah, we 3D printed it in stainless steel after we got a 3D model. We 3D printed a frame to hold the coils of wire for the poly well. And that has a number of advantages because, one, it's like one piece because it's steel. It's not going to break apart because the magnets are going to be really repulsive. So the one piece of steel makes it structurally stronger. When did you make the model and when did you print it? It was the summer after our sophomore year, and we used Shapeways, which is a great 3D printing company. So you're building this poly well, and you decide to do Kickstarter. Why Kickstarter? Kickstarter, it's had a lot of success stories. So Dan and I thought it would be a good idea to just try it, because, you know, why not? The worst that could happen was that we didn't get any funds. We set up a campaign and put a lot of work into it. Yeah, we did get some help from random donors, which was really beneficial. It was a great experience. The main thing that made it different than other fundraisers is it had a really short timeline. It attracts people to help your campaign quickly. Yeah, I think the urgency definitely helped the funding. We have done like a year-long campaign. That's it's the tendency with most long-term projects. They actually kick the can down the road, and then we may not get funded as well as we had in our short time frame. I think the other thing that was really interesting about Kickstarter is it really taught us how to network. Because, yes, we had friends and relatives donate. I had to go convince random people to donate. I had to sell them on nuclear fusion. And in fact, I met a scientist working at a national lab doing that. So I think that Kickstarter's experience was valuable not only for the money, but also for networking and the outreach. Wonderful. What was the time frame for that? It was August 2014, and it just lasted 30 days. How much money did you guys raise? $2,016. <laughs> cool. So $2,016, what could you get with that in terms of your project? What did that buy you? We were able to invest in a fair amount of vacuum equipment. We were able to get our pump and control panel and a fair amount of the chamber, as well as a lot of raw materials that we needed. We were also able to purchase some additional circuit equipment, such as the Variac transformer, to process a lot of those pieces. But then most of the money went to the vacuum, and that was probably a good investment, right? The vacuum is definitely the most expensive part of the project because it requires a lot of stainless steel, nice pumping equipment, control panel. So you want to invest in a solid system to get a good outcome. So now, take me back to the fall of 2014. You've got your 3D printed poly well, you've raised your money. What happens next? A lot of building, and also a lot of... We've had the same core circuit design, but we've changed and thrown out so many sections nowadays that the circuit design now is probably almost unrecognizable from the original one that we had drafted. You know, advancing design, making it more efficient, and then really trying to actually implement it and get it to work properly. And I think one or two major problems to really hammer out before we can start preliminary testing. So you were doing this while you were doing homework, right, for high school? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely very busy during the school year, and the 
project is time consuming as well. So you really have to manage your time well. But Dan and I are good at that. We get it done. We meet on the weekends and it's definitely doable. You always have a little bit of extra time and that time is better spent doing fusion work and like learning and experiencing science in an exciting way. So is it more fun to do this than your, your homework? Because yeah. there's, there's more of a tangible return than, you know, handing in a few worksheets. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun to put parts together and see your results when you get something working and see your progress, too. So where are you now? What are you currently working on? What is your next milestone? So the thing that we are struggling with and the thing we will most likely be eternally struggling with until the very end of the project is vacuum equipment and getting as good of a vacuum as we can. Right now, our turbo pump is having a reporter rotor lock failure but overall everything's moving forward at a pretty decent clip our real focus right now is just getting our turbo pump working because our vacuum system is pretty solid and our roughing pump pressure is low enough for the turbo pump to work well if our turbo pump fails which it might because turbo pumps are very hard to deal with we might have to go for an oil diffusion pump which would hopefully be a lot simpler and not have as many problems do you have any advice for anyone else your age that wants to try this a few pieces of advice one absolutely try to do it just know it will be a somewhat longer term project and then doing this project don't be afraid to go out and network and i don't just mean call your friends and your physics teachers i also mean feel free to contact scientists physicists find a lot of the people that are pretty willing to help and willing to at the very least look at your project and give you some advice another thing is if you're looking for raw materials i will say that mcmaster car is probably one of the best companies to get most of your raw materials from so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give that a little plug <laughs> Stay dedicated to the project, and you're going to experience a lot of challenges, but that's really what makes it enjoyable in some ways, and also it makes you learn a lot, too. And just stick with it. Know that you're capable of doing it. The Fuser.net community have done projects like this before and have seen success in them. And then the last thing I would say is to try to push something new that hasn't been tested because there's a lot of different opportunities to to test new things in this field, even in your garage or basement or whatever. You don't have to be a professional to try new experiments and to take a gamble at something to get results. We are trying a completely new and untested and unused circuit design. And if anything, high school is the best time to do it because you kind of have the leeway and the freedom to explore whatever you want. So what do you think you want to do with your career or your life? Yeah, I'm excited for college, of course. I'm definitely looking to go into science. Science, but not necessarily fusion. I'm not sure exactly what field. And I think my dream job as of now would be maybe like Trialpha Energy. That's an awesome company that has produced exciting results and inspired us. So. How about you, Dane? I'm definitely going to go into the sciences. As for nuclear fusion, I think I'm definitely going to consider that as a major or a minor in physics. I'm also considering trying to expand the presence of fusion on whatever college campus I'm on. I'm thinking about trying to start a fusion club or build a third reactor and try to generally expand the awareness, knowledge, and hopefully drive to continue doing your contribution. Okay. Like when I was your age, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So <laughs> I think you gave about the best answer that you can give. Is there anything else you want to add? I think one thing that's important that we didn't talk about much is just safety in the project. When you're building the project, a lot of people, they don't necessarily understand what you're doing exactly, and they're always going to say, are you building a bomb or something? And no, it's fusion. It's not that super dangerous. For us, it's mainly the circuit, which is a real danger, but high voltage, high current. There's no radioactive issues, of course, because we're not getting a high neutron count. Safety is huge. If you decide to go into this project, just make sure you have electricians who are helping you. Okay, Dane? Not much. I suppose good luck. <laughs> good luck. Good luck to all the people that want to try to do this. Thank you so much, and you guys have a nice night. Yeah, thank you. you. All right. Yeah, thank you for talking with us. No problem. Okay.